All right, who'd like to ask the first question? We can pretend this is like a presidential uh, press conference. Who would like to ask a question? Um, yeah, I was going to say, I was wondering if we could maybe just like review the measurements lab because I was looking through it and I was a little confused on kind of like the layout of everything and stuff. Sure, let me open that up so that uh, we can all look at it at the same time. So I'm going to change my share screen to uh, my desktop, actually to my browser, I should say. I don't know how to share my desktop, to be honest with you. Uh, let's go to um, measurements. I'll open that up. OK, so are you kind of asking, what do you want me to have you turn in? Or are you asking something uh, a little bit different? No, that's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah. OK. So you can see that uh, I want you to have the following sections, title, intro, safety, procedure, et cetera. Um, so the title is easy measurements. Introduction, I would talk a little bit about measuring and how you do it. Mm -hmm. And I would also talk about uh, not only how you do it, but uh, a little bit about the different types of measurements you're gonna be making like uh, volume, length, and uh, mass. Uh, for your procedure, you can pretty much copy what you did for the lab. Uh, you should be writing the procedure as you do the lab. In this particular case, if we look at the procedure, you can copy that right out and that's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, for the data, I would expect to see uh, measurements of the note card length and width using the store ruler, length and width using the um, paper ruler. I'd expect to see the mass of the paper ruler, the mass of the store ruler. Hmm. I'd expect to um, see the data for the volume of the liquid in your uh, graduated cylinder. And I believe those are the measurements you had to make. Okay. And so that should be in your data section. Hmm. Now for the calculations, this is based on the assignment. So let's scroll down to the assignment. So you can see I'm asking you to calculate the area of the card. And I'm expecting you, of course, to write this with the correct number of significant figures. Mm -hmm. And now that I think about that, that's something maybe you want to put in your intro is that we're going to practice carrying zig figs through uh, operations. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you should actually show the calculation. So you could write A is equal to length times width. And then you could put uh, 2.72 times uh, 5.63. Those are not the measurements I imagine of an index card, but they might be the measurements of a, of a office card or a, what do they call those? A business card. Mm -hmm. um, and then you write the answer out with the correct number of significant figures and the correct units. And uh, that's something I'd put in my calculations. Now, since you do have an assignment here, you could say for number one assignment, see the first calculation. Mm -hmm. Also in your calculations, I would label the calculations like uh, if you're calculating the area based on the store ruler, I'd say area based on store ruler than the calculation underneath. Mm -hmm. Area based on the paper ruler calculation underneath. So you're supposed to show those calculations. Uh, you could also write area of the paper ruler was determined the same way and the area is. And the reason you wouldn't necessarily need to write that calculation again is because it's just like the first one, but it has a different number of significant figures. Mm -hmm. Two, which measurements of the card are more precise? Explain. So we're talking about paper ruler versus a uh, uh, store ruler. Now here, that's, there's no calculation here. You have to just decide which one is more precise. Mm -hmm. And when you're only making single measurements like that, you're gonna base it on what is the smallest number known. So is it in the ones place? Is it in the 10th or the hundredth? And so naturally you'd say, well, the store ruler is more precise because the divisions were smaller. Mm -hmm. And therefore we could record to the hundredth of a centimeter instead of to just a 10th of a centimeter. And that's something you wouldn't put in the calculation section, but you'd put in this section. Mm -hmm. Are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and all of this stuff that we're talking about, the assignment, it does not have to go into your lab notebook, but I suggest it does. You might as well 
add another section after discussion that says assignment. Mm -hmm. And then you could say, refer to the calculations for this one. Here's the answer to this one, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, here, the results. So after the, uh, where am I? I'm lost. OK, after the results, uh, you really only have a one result here, one type of result, and that's the area of the card. Mm -hmm. And then your discussion. So the discussion should be somewhere along the lines of uh, was uh, obtaining these measurements uh, what you thought it would be? Uh, was carrying the significant figures through calculations what you thought it would be? For this one, I don't think you're going to have a very long discussion. But what I do not want to hear is um, the lab went well. Mm -hmm. I mean, naturally, I hope the lab went well, but I don't think that's a discussion. The lab went well or the lab went horribly. Right. What you want to do is you want to say, well, we were able to make these measurements. Uh, it took a while to get used to measuring to a tenth of the smallest unit, especially with that paper ruler, because I knew the dimension with a with a store ruler. So I just wanted to use the same number again. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of people want to do. And that's inappropriate. You use whatever device you have, but you might say, you know, it took a little while to get comfortable, stuff like that. And, uh, and then you figure it out. You might also write down <clears throat> that it took you a little while to figure out the meniscus and to get your eye at the proper height, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. And so that's what goes in your discussion. Okay. And ultimately what the lab is supposed to be is it supposed to be a document that if you look at it in a hundred years, you can do the same thing and get the same results? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even more importantly, since you're going to be dead, someone else could look at your lab notebook, do the same experiment and get the same results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You with me? That's what a lab notebook is. Someone can repeat your experiment and get the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're not putting down enough information for them to do that, then uh, it's not a good lab notebook. Right. Okay. Now, once you write all that in your lab notebook, I want you to take a photo of each page, upload it to your computer and change it into a PDF. And then I'd like to use submit photos of the write-up. And you can see, I also want you to sit, submit three photos of your paper ruler on the scale. So I can see the numbers on the scale the meniscus of the water in the graduated cylinder. So I can look at what you took a picture of and see if you're recording that value correctly. Mm -hmm. And the length of the card showing the store ruler next to the card so that I can see the, the number and the measurement to see if, again, you're doing that correctly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, answer these questions. Huh. Uh, you'll notice I didn't say anything about putting the materials list in there. Because mm -hmm. normally when you uh, use the procedure, it, it automatically defaults to, well, oh, put a paper ruler on the scale and measure it. Well, you need a scale. Mm -hmm. So usually right. you don't write a materials list. Okay. Uh, safety, you do need to write. And I think that's uh, important enough to put after the introduction. Okay. And if there are no safety issues, that's what you write. Sure. But you always address safety. Right. Uh, the, for the procedure, well, we did that, the assignment. So let's look at some more of this assignment. Number seven is one that there is no calculation. You're just writing it in scientific notation. Uh, looks like. 4, 5, and 6 show calculations. So you want to show calculations in your calculation section. Mm -hmm. Looks like 8, 9, 10 show calculations. And 11, you're just going to look at this image here and tell me what the length is. So that's something you wouldn't put in your calculations. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that this says centimeters, and you're measuring from the end of the eraser to the tip of the uh, lead. And you'd write down the appropriate number. All right. Cool. Does that help at all? Yeah. Yeah, it helps a lot. Okay, um, good. Yeah, because it was all pretty simple, but it's just kind of like getting adjusted to the way these labs work and stuff and getting like into the, I don't know, just being able to like understand it more easily, like as we go through the class.
Right. And what I would do at format. first to try and make things a little easier is I'd probably make bullet points for, hmm. here's the intro. Uh, one bullet point would be, you know, when using a digital device, record all the numbers in the unit. Mm -hmm. Next bullet, when using an analog device, find the smallest division, measure to a tenth of that, and add the appropriate unit. Mm, for sure. uh, I might even put things like a, when carrying a significant figures through addition and subtraction, the answer has the same precision as whichever beginning number was least precise. Mm -hmm. Uh, for multiplication division, the answer has the same number of zig figs as the beginning number that had the fewest. Mm -hmm. You know, I might put little things like that in the intro too. For sure. Okay, cool. Uh, and those are basically reminders of me of how to do those things so I don't have to memorize them. Right, right. Or more importantly, when you write it down, it tends to help you memorize them. Mm -hmm. uh, writing helps seep things into your memory far better than just saying it. Or looking at it. One of yeah, the definitely. worst memory tools is to look at something repeatedly until you think you understand it. Because you're going to find out on the exam that you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. So good question. Cool. Who's next? Anyone else have another question? Don't be afraid to ask. Worst thing that can happen is I give you disappointed dad. No questions. So, well, I'm going to give you guys disappointed dad so you know what's in, in store for you when you do something that disappoints me. So let's see. I'm usually pretty good at this. So this is disappointed dad. You're better than this. You know you're better than this. I'm so disappointed. All right. So we want to avoid disappointed dad at all costs because it will sear into your soul. But the good thing about disappointed dad is it will make you want to rise above it all and do so much better. Okay. All right. And I don't want to deprive you of doing better. So with that being said, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another switch screen. Actually, I can't. I got to turn on my Elmo. And once that gets turned on, we're going to do a switch screen where we're looking at my Elmo. This will take a moment. Oh, my Elmo's not plugged in. Oh, yeah. Almost there. Okay. Now let me do my switch screen. Okay, so what you should see now is uh, my tabletop. And uh, we spent last week going over some of the problems uh, in the middle of the chapter around page 21, 22, and so forth. Does this look familiar to anybody that's been attending the afternoon sections? Give me a little yes if it seems familiar. Okay, that's fine if it doesn't. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you the, some material from the second half of the chapter. And these problems start on about page 50. So I'm going to show you again how to do this and what kind of work I'd expect to see on an exam. So this is what is the temperature or the temperature of the sun is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the third degrees Celsius. What is the temperature in Kelvin? So 
So the first thing I want to teach you is uh, about scientific notation. Scientific notation. is when you write a number according to the following format. Number times 10 to the uh, e, where e is some exponent. n must be greater than or equal to 1 and less than 10. So n can be 1, 2, 3, 4. It can be uh, 5.6. It cannot be 11.2. e is a whole number, which means it's got to be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. 0, 1, 2, 3, and dot, 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 dot. So E is a whole number, not a fraction. OK. And the second thing I want to tell you about scientific notation is when you look at 10 to the E, if E is greater than 0, then the number is greater than 1. And if e is less than zero, the number is less than one. So when I look at this number, 5.5 times 10 to the third, that three means that this number is bigger than one. This whole number is bigger than one or greater than one, whichever uh, you prefer. So if this is greater than one and I wanna change this away from scientific notation, get rid of that 10 to the third, I'm going to move the decimal over three times. Now, which way do I move the decimal to make this number bigger? Do I move it to the left or to the right? And the answer is I'm going to move it to the right because I'll get 5,500. If I move it to the left, I get 0 0.0055. So the positive number means I got to make this look like a big number. And that's a pretty big number. So um, that's what you want to remember about the uh, the exponent, positive means bigger than one, negative means less than one. If it had been 5.5 times 10 to the minus three, we would say less than one. So we would have moved the decimal over three times, one, two, three, and gotten 0 0.0055. Another important thing to notice about scientific notation is that when you look at 5.5, times 10 to the third, or any number written in scientific notation, the number of significant figures is found by looking at n. So this has two significant figures. OK. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that you want to memorize this formula. If you want to get Kelvin, you take degrees Celsius and you add 273.15. And this is precise to the hundredth of a Kelvin. So in this case, I'm going to take my 5,500 and I'm going to add to it 270. 3.15, I made that into a two, but since I put a little line through it, now it's a seven. So five, seven, seven, three point one five. Now the rule for addition and subtraction is that the answer has the same precision as whichever beginning number has uh, the least precision. This is precise to the hundreds. This is precise to the hundredths. To the left, it's a ed. To the right, it's an ed. So this is going to be precise to the hundreds. And the way it's written, it's not. So we're going to round to right here. This seven makes that into an eight, and we write zero, zero. And so our answer is k is equal to 5,800. And what I put in the box is what I would expect to see on an exam. I like to see the formula you're using. And then I should actually say, I like to see this.
and then your answer with the correct number of significant figures. Are there any questions on what I would expect to see on the exam? Okay, that being said, let's take a look at this next problem. Make the following conversions. So I will show you what I would expect to see on the exam for A. Uh, I will box it, but I'm gonna show you that we have K is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273.15. I would then turn this into degrees Celsius is K minus 273.15. Okay, so I did that all in my head, but here's what I did. And again, I would not expect to see this on the test, but I'm helping you review your algebra if you need it. So the golden rule is that in algebra is what you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other side to keep it equal. So I'm gonna subtract 273.15 from this side, and I'm gonna subtract 273.15 from this side. So I get K minus 273.15 is equal to degrees Celsius. Another rule in algebra is if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. So C is my B, I'm gonna take it over here. So this is where I got this formula from, but I did it all in my head without showing all the work because you do not need to show the work. You just need to have the right formula. So now we would have 77 minus 273.15. It's always uh, important in my opinion to estimate the answer. We can see that if we have 77 and minus 273, the answer should be close to 100. So I'm gonna plug this into my calculator. 77 minus 273.15. And my calculator says minus 196.15. Now this is good to the ones and this is good to the hundredth, which is least precise, the ones. So I'm gonna round this to the ones and we get degrees Celsius is minus 196. Now, out of all of this, this is what I would expect to see for this problem. I don't want to see this answer because it's not the answer. Are there any questions on A? If you have a question, you want to raise your hand. Okay, are we okay on A? If we're okay, uh, find your participant list and give me the thumbs up or give me a yes, one or the other, I don't care. Okay, excellent. Now, what I would like you to do, since I've already given you examples of B and C, I'd like you to go ahead and do B and do C. When you're done, give me a thumbs up or a yes that you're done. And then I'll show you the work that I would like to see on the exam. Remember your goal is to do this and show the work that Tony would expect on the exam. So go for it. And give me a yes when you're done. <laughs> While you're working on this, I'll provide the appropriate music. I don't know if I've done this for you before, but. What do you think? Does the Jeopardy music help you guys? No, not so much. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, we've got one person who's done. Or maybe that was a comment on the Jeopardy theme music. Okay, since we're a little slow to finish this up, I'm gonna pause this for just a moment, the recording. Otherwise, when you watch this later, you're gonna be bored. I can't see C and I don't um, oh. have my book with me at the moment. My apologies. Thanks. Okay, this is a pause and I'm gonna make some more coffee. <laughs> Remember, you want to give me a little signal that you're done. Okay, so we got a couple of people that are done and I'm assuming that others are probably done, but they don't want a signal. So if we look at B, you want to calculate Kelvin. So Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So you want to memorize that. So the Kelvin is going to equal 63 plus 273.15. So if we make an estimate here, the estimate's going to be around 350 or so. So let's see what we get. I don't have any movement on the other screen. Is that the same for everyone else? Because I can't see you doing anything there. I still have just four and A. You can't see anything down here below? It's all to the left, but no, I just see the four and the A. I don't see you working, although I can see your screen that you are. That's why I'm asking if it's just my screen. Well, I'm not sure. Can everyone see what I'm writing here? I don't see you writing at the moment, no. You can't. Maybe no. when you paused it, you didn't. Oh, uh, that's right. I didn't, I didn't show you the, uh, that's probably it. Yeah, go ahead and show <laughs> Good call. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Allison, for saying something. You know, maybe I didn't pause it. I probably just paused my share. Mm. Okay, so we have K is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273.15. Mm -hmm. K is 63 plus 273.15. Uh, and so here, I'm going to put this into my calculator, and I think it's going to be around 350. Now, I'm not trying to get the exact number, but I'm trying to get an ish. So my calculator says 336.15. So I'm going to round to the ones because that's good to the ones. That's good to the hundredth. That's good to the ones. So we're done. Any questions about B? If you do, please raise your hand or ask away. Okay. So let's take a look at C. So I know from this formula, that degree Celsius is K minus 273.15. So I'm going to write degree Celsius is 1450. Oh, not, yep, yeah, minus 273.15. And my calculator says uh, 1100 and let's see. Well, that didn't work. So my calculator says 1,176.85. This is good to the tens. And this is good to the hundreds. So I'm going to round to the tens. 
So I'm going to make it 1-1, one, one, and then it says 7-6. Seven, because the 7 is followed by a 6, it becomes 1-1-8-0. One, one, and this would be the work I'd expect for C. Anya Dog, do you have a question or are you good? Uh, yeah, I do. So for the rounding part, why did you do ones and tens? But well, you just chose the rule ones. for addition and subtraction is the precision of the answer. matches uh, the precision of the beginning number that is less precise. So when we look at a number like this, one, two, three point, four, five, six, and we look at the precision. This is called the thousands. Actually, this is, uh, this is called the uh, hundreds, my bad. This is called the tens. This is called the ones. This is called the tenth. Hundredth. and thousandth. When we look at the precision here, hundred is less precise than 10, is less precise than the ones, is less precise than the 10th, is less precise and so forth and so on. The more you know about a number to the right, the more precise it is. With addition subtraction, you're rounding based on which one is least precise. So in this case, I've got a one versus a hundredth. So I round to the ones. Here I've got a tens versus a hundredth, so I round to the tens. Are we good now, Anya Dog? Yeah, that makes more sense. I was just confused because you said both, but I was understanding why. Yeah, it, it's the precision of whichever one is the least precise. All right, thank you. You bet. Okay. Oh, shoot. I wrote on the back of a piece of paper I didn't want to write on the back of. Oh, well. Okay. Let's take a look at this next one. The average lead pencil. U and unused is 19 centimeters long. What is its length in millimeters and in meters? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something called the conversion factor method. It's also called unit analysis. It's also called dimensional analysis. It's called a number of different things, but it's a way to convert from one number and unit to an equivalent number and unit. In this case, we're going to convert 19 centimeters into millimeters, and we're going to convert 19 centimeters into meters. So. I'm going to start off with the second one first, 19 centimeters to meters, and I'm going to show you two ways to do it. But before that, a little bit of a background. So we all know that 12 inches is equal to one foot. I like it so much, I'm going to write it twice. Now, we also know that the golden rule in algebra is that what you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other side to keep it equal. So in this case, I'm dividing each side by one foot. So we end up with 12 inches over one foot is equal to one. And that seems appropriate because 12 inches and one foot are equal. So I, if I have an equal amount divided by an equal amount, I should get one. You can see on this one, I'm dividing each side by 12 inches. So here I get the inverse of that. I get one foot over 12 inches is equal to one. That shouldn't surprise us again because one foot and 12 inches are equal. So both of these are equal to one. 
So the important thing to learn is that when you have something like x is equal to y, you can get x over y is equal to one, or you can get y over x is equal to one. Any equality, you can do this. So if you had 50 miles is equal to one hour, that would mean you're driving 50 miles per hour. You could get 50 miles over one hour or one hour over 50 miles. That's equal to one and that's equal to one. Okay, so how do we convert from centimeters to meters? You have to know the relationship between centimeters and meters. And this is one way to do it. One centimeter is equal to one centimeter. And then if you've memorized all the prefixes, which you should do, so mega is 10 to the six, kilo is 10 to the three, Deci is 10 to the minus one. Centi is 10 to the minus two. Milli is 10 to the minus three. Micro is 10 to the minus six. Nano is 10 to the minus nine. And Pico is 10 to the minus 12. I'll let you figure out what the words are for each of these symbols. You need to memorize these. This is a perfect set of uh, things to use a flashcard for. Okay, so this means that I can substitute 10 to the minus two for one of these C's. So this is a fact, it's a conversion and it's exact. So if I have 19 centimeters and I want to convert this into meters, it stands to reason that I'd like to multiply by something that has centimeters on top and meters on the bottom so that the centimeters cancel. So here I'm going to put one centimeter on the bottom and one times 10 to the minus two meters on top. And when I work this out, I get 0.19 meters. So this is the kind of work I would expect to see for a problem like that, where we're converting from a prefix and a unit to no unit at all, or to no prefix at all. But for this particular problem, there's a number of different ways that you can show your work. So I'm gonna show you a few of those. So I want you to recall that I had that one centimeter is one times 10 to the minus two meters. Now, what happens if I multiply each side by 10 to the positive two? Well, 10 to the positive two is 100. So this side becomes 100 centimeters. 10 to the minus two times 10 to the positive two is 10 to the zero, which is one. One times one is one, so I get one meter. Now this is something you may know that 100 centimeters are in a meter. And if you know that, that's fine. You don't have to do all this work to get there. So I can take 19 centimeters and multiply by 100 centimeters on the bottom so that these cancel and one meter on top and we will get 0.19 meters. And this is an appropriate way to do this problem also. In this particular case, there's one more appropriate way to do the problem, and that's this. So what is this method here? It's called substitution. If we think about this prefix here, centi, it's not real. It's representing a numerical amount. It's not real. So here I'm putting what it really means in instead of the fake abbreviation for it, if you will. So this would be a way to do it too. It doesn't work the other way around. You can't go backwards and substitute. So there are three different ways of doing that problem. Next problem, 
what is its length in millimeters? So we're gonna do this two ways. We're gonna take 19 centimeters, convert that into meters, and then convert that into millimeters. So I'm gonna put a one here and a two here. What's the relationship between a centimeter and a meter? We already know it's 100 centimeters is one meter. What's the relationship between a millimeter and a meter? Well, maybe you haven't memorized what a millimeter is. So this is the way you start. And then you substitute. And you get that. So let's take a look for number one. I'm going to use this conversion. And this side goes on the bottom so that the centimeters cancel. And then for number two, I'm going to use this conversion. And the meter goes on the bottom so that the meters cancel. Centimeters cancel, meters cancel. So that means the one millimeter goes on top. And then we'll find out that this is going to be uh, Let me think about it for a second. It's going to be 190 millimeters. That has two significant figures. That has two significant figures. So this is uh, one appropriate answer for this. Some people know off the top of their head that there are 10 millimeters in one centimeter. And here we can use this alone. and get 190 millimeters. So either of these would be correct. Now, one of the things that may be a little uh, uh, weird to you is, um, how do you know this centimeters cancels with that centimeters? And the answer is that really this is 19 over one. And remember, this is equal to one, and this is equal to one. And here, we're multiplying 19 by one by one, so we're getting the same amount as we have here, but just with a different unit and a different number. But if I hold my fingers 19 centimeters apart, 19 centimeters is about uh, five inches. So this would be about 19 centimeters apart. That's also 190 millimeters. OK, any questions about this? Are you OK so far? That's a yes or no. OK, we're going to move on. A compact disc has a diameter of 11.8 centimeters. What is the surface area of the disc in square centimeters, in square meters? Uh, so here, we have a problem. And most of us would claim to be visual learners. So we pr should probably draw a picture. There's your compact disc. And here's the little hole in the middle so that it'll match up with the spindle. And the diameter goes from one edge to the other edge of the disc where the length is the greatest. We're given that the area of a circle is pi r squared. And so we're given the diameter, which means we can calculate the radius. Now I'm going to show you how to do this problem, and it's going to be wrong. So you might be wondering, why is he showing us something that's going to be wrong? And the answer is you never learn from doing something correctly. You learn from making mistakes. So we're going to make a mistake. 
half of 11.8, since that's really close to 12, it should be really close to six. So half of this is 5.9. So notice I have the 5.9 and I have the unit. I'm gonna estimate this so I know that when I put it into my calculator, I'm not using my calculator incorrectly. Six times six is 36. 36 times pi, which is three, should be around 100, maybe a little bit more. So when you use pi on your calculator, it actually comes out I don't know if you can see that pi. Watch what happens when I put equal. 3.1459. This has a whole lot of significant figures. So I'm going to multiply that times 5.9 and then times 5.9. And I get 109.35. So what do I report for my answer here? How many significant figures do I want in my answer? Based on what I've written, I want two. So I'm going to write one, one, zero centimeters squared. And this is the wrong answer. OK, so let me show you why it's wrong. The radius is half of the diameter. This is defined. So if I write 11.8 centimeters over two, I get 5.90 centimeters. So how come I have a number here in the hundredth and here I don't? And the answer is because that has three significant figures. This two has an infinity number of significant figures. So with three significant figures and infinity, my answer should have three significant figures. So I need to put a trailing zero in there. And that trailing zero is significant because I can see the decimal. So now when I do this problem and I put in that radius, you can see that we need three significant figures. So we're gonna write as our answer 109. centimeters squared. So you could do it this way and that would be fine. The only thing that I would add to this is this right here. You could also do it this way. Whoops, that zero shouldn't be there. So here the four is exact. Pi has got at least 10 zig figs on your calculator. We have three zig figs here, so we end up with three here. So is everyone okay with uh, writing out that or that for your final answer? Okay, then let's move on. Some soft drinks are sold in bottles with a volume of 1.5 liters. What is this volume in milliliters, in cubic centimeters, in cubic decimeters? So we're gonna convert from 1.5 liters to milliliters. So how do I figure out the conversion between those? I write one milliliter is equal to one milliliter. And then I substitute one times 10 to the negative three liters. So I 10 to the minus three for that milli. Now, if you don't like these exponents 
that are negative, you can get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them is as follows. And maybe you don't like exponents at all, but if you take a look here, 10 to the minus three times 10 to the three is 10 to the zero. 10 to the zero times one is 10 to the zero. And 10 to the zero is one. So you might ask, why did I multiply this by 10 to the positive three to turn it into one? 10 to the third is a thousand. So we get a thousand milliliters is one liter. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. You need to be able to figure out these metric conversions. How many of them are to memorize? 100, 100 of them, if you wanna try and do this, okay? But, this isn't too bad. What I mean by that is if you memorize this, then you also know that 1,000 kilograms is one gram. 1,000 kiloseconds is one second. Oh, excuse me. Milligrams is one gram. Milliseconds is one second. My bad. 1,000 uh, millimeters is one meter. So this works for just about everything. And then you would also have things like 100 centimeters is one meter. 100 centigrams is one gram. 100 centiseconds is one second. Uh, 100 uh, centiliters is one liter and so forth and so on. You need to be able to figure out the metric conversions easily. So practice that. So here, I'm gonna use this guy right here and this, and I'm gonna say 1.5 liters times, now which one am I gonna put on the bottom? One liter and 1000 milliliters on top. And I get 1.5 times 10 cubed milliliters. So this is all I would expect to see for your answer, something like that. So that's milliliters. So this is yes or no. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, here's another conversion you should memorize. One milliliter is one centimeter cubed. And in fact, this is how a milliliter is defined. So this has infinite significant figures as well as this. So we need to convert to cubic centimeters. So 1.5 times 10 to the third milliliters. I would expect to see this work for converting this number to cubic centimeters. So on the first exam, if I ask you to convert from milliliters to cubic centimeter or cubic centimeter to milliliter, I expect to see this work. On exams after that, you can just substitute centimeter cubed for milliliter. That will be fine. Are there any questions about this part? That's a yes or no, any questions? Okay, now let me show you how to convert to cubic decimeters. So what I'm gonna write out is one decimeter is equal to one decimeter. So one decimeter is one times 10 to the minus one meters. And personally, I don't really like negative exponents. So I'm gonna say 10, to the one decimeters is equal to one meter. I can, I learned from previously that I can just basically take this, put it on the other side, make it a positive and it works. So I don't even need that 10 to the one, I can write 10 decimeters instead of 10 to the one. So here I don't have any uh, exponents. I got 10 decimeters is one meter. Okay. 
but also I have 100 centimeters is one meter. Okay. So I'm going to take this 1.5 times 10 cubed centimeters cubed and convert it. Now, let's see that there's something very clever we can do here. We notice that we're going to convert this to meters and then to decimeters. We'll see what I mean in just a minute. But I can avoid that altogether. I mean, I could do this times one meter over 100 centimeters. I could do that, but I'm not going to because I'm going to be a little bit more clever. Notice that 10 decimeters is one meter, 100 centimeters is one meter. So I can say that 10 decimeters is 100 centimeters. Or if I simplify it, one decimeter is 10 centimeters. So I'm gonna use this to make my conversion. Now, what I'm gonna show you at first is gonna be wrong. So we have 1.5 times 10 cubed centimeters cubed, and we're converting that into decimeters cubed. And we have 10 centimeters is equal to one decimeter. Okay, so this is cubed and this is not. So what I'm gonna show you is a way to do this wrong. It's absolutely wrong. 10 centimeters cubed is one decimeter cubed. This is wrong. It looks like it's right because I cubed each side, but it's wrong. And so, let me show you why it is wrong. So this is a cubic decimeter. 10, one decimeter on the edge, on each edge. A centimeter is one tenth of a decimeter. So this is one centimeter cubed. This says that we need 10 of these small little blocks to make one of these big blocks. Can you see how ridiculous that is? There's no way 10 of these blocks is gonna make this big guy. A hundred of them are not gonna make this big guy. How many of these little blocks do we need to make this big block? A thousand of them. So let me show you what we should have done with this. So this is correct, absolutely 100% correct. So the golden rule of algebra what you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. Not what you do to part of one side is what you do to part of the other side. You got to do it to the whole side. So I'm going to square this side. Actually, I'm going to cube this side and cube that side, 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. So now that we have this, we can use this. And we find that this is 1.5 decimeters cubed. So that's fine. And now I'm gonna show you one more way. It's the way I really prefer to do this. So I'm gonna use this 1.5 times 10 to the third centimeters cubed. I'm gonna use 10 centimeters is equal to one decimeter. And I'm going to solve this without doing this, but without changing that into something incorrect. So here we go. So I'm going to put centimeter on the bottom so it'll cancel with one of these centimeters. Doesn't cancel with all three of them. So 
if I'm only canceling one centimeter, how do I get rid of the other two? And the answer is, do this again and again. We're essentially multiplying by one, multiplying by one, multiplying by one. And here you end up getting 1.5 decimeters cubed. So this would be an appropriate way to do it also. So this is yes or no. Do you have any questions about this one? Okay, we'll move on then. And U U.S. dime has a mass of 2.65 grams. What is its mass in kilograms, in milligrams, so forth and so on? So we're going to take our 2.265 grams and turn that into kilograms. To find this conversion, I'm going to write one kilogram is one kilogram. And I know that K means 10 to the third or a thousand. So one kg is equal to 1,000 G. So I'm going to write 2.65 G times. I'm going to put that on the bottom so things cancel. I'm going to put this on the top. And we're going to get 2.265 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. Now let's take a look at what we've written here. We've basically written that 2.265 grams is 2.265 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. So we should have an idea of whether this is right or not, or whether this should be a positive three. So I want to, in your mind, I want you to think about how you would describe a kilogram to a person who doesn't know anything about kilograms. It doesn't need to be exact, but I want them to walk away with knowing what a kilogram is approximately. So what would you do to tell people this? And the answer is really simple. A kilogram is a little bit more than two pounds. So everyone has an idea of what two pounds is. A kilogram is two of those plus a little more. How would you describe a gram to someone? Well, this is a great way to describe it. A gram is what a dollar bill weighs. It's pretty close, it's not exact. Another way to describe it is a nickel. A nickel weighs five grams. Now, you're not telling a person what a gram actually weighs, but you're giving them a good idea of what one gram weighs, one fifth of a nickel. So, clearly, grams are much smaller than kilograms. So, does this make sense that one gram is a very small fraction of a kilogram? Absolutely. Because the smaller number times 10 to the minus three goes with the bigger unit. That's the way it always works. Look at these two units, inches and feet. Which is the smaller unit, which should have the bigger number? Inch. Inch is smaller than a foot, and it has the bigger number. That's the way it always works. Whoops. You go into an Irish pub and you tell them you're an American and you tell them that you'd like a beer and they say, well, do you want a quart or a pint or a liter? It's the same price. What's your answer? So which is bigger, a quart or a liter? And the answer is liters are bigger. Smaller number goes with a bigger unit. 
if this is one liter and this is 0.946 liters, then this is one quart. Smaller number goes with the bigger unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we've converted this to kilograms. Let's convert it to milligrams. We know that one milligram is one milligram. One milligram is one times 10 to the minus three grams. I'm gonna leave it like that and write down one times 10 to the minus three grams, one milligram. And I'm gonna get 2.265 times 10 to the three milligrams. So here, a milligram is much smaller than a gram. It's a thousand times smaller. So bigger number with the smaller unit. So are there any questions about this particular problem? Okay, we are gonna move on. A piece of silver metal has a mass of 2.365 grams if the density of silver is 10.5 grams per centimeter cube, what is the volume of the silver? First of all, I'm gonna say, I don't like it when books do this. I think that this is better because you know clearly what's in the numerator, what's in the denominator. Now, I don't know if I told you this, but I used to have trouble with numerator and denominator until I finally figured out a way for me to remember. And the way I remember it is numerator starts with an N, which means north, and denominator starts with a D, which means down. Numerators in the north, denominators in the, in the is down. Uh, you can't teach this method in the Southern Hemisphere because in the Southern Hemisphere, as far as they're concerned, south is on top and north is on the bottom. So when you go look at a globe and South America or in Africa, it's, it's upside down for, for us. It's weird. All right, actually, I don't know if that's the case. All right, so I'm gonna take my 2.365 grams and I'm gonna take my density and I'm thinking to myself, I could do this problem so easily if I had a relationship between grams and centimeters cubed. Well, this here is a ratio, which means 10.5 grams is one centimeter cubed. I can write it out as inequality. So when I write it out this way, I realize, oh, I can put that on top and I can put that on the bottom. That is just fine. So when we estimate the answer, you can see it's gonna be around 0.2. I want you to think of this answer before I do the work. The eight question is, how many significant figures are we allowed in the answer? Okay, I'm gonna show you. We're allowed three significant figures because of the 10.5. So this is one way to do this problem and that's perfectly fine. A longer way to do the problem would be this way. Density is mass divided by volume. That is the definition of density. Therefore, volume is mass divided by density. Therefore, Volume is 2.365 grams over 10.5 grams per centimeter cubed. And this ends up being 0.225 centimeters cubed. So this would be another way to do the problem. Write out the formula for density, rearrange it, put the numbers in and get your answer. I prefer this just because it's simpler and it uses unit analysis and 
uh, dimensional analysis, uh, conversion factor, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Let's try another one. We got two more minutes. How would we answer a problem like this? Which occupies a larger volume, 600 grams of water or 600 grams of lead? And they give you the density of both of these. Well, if we look at the water, density is mass divided by volume, which means that volume is mass divided by density, which in this case means 600 grams divided by 0 0.995 grams per centimeter cubed which means, since that's really close to one, the answer is 600-ish centimeters cubed. And in fact, I think the answer is 600 because this has one zig fig, this has three, so we're allowed one. So 600 is the answer. For the lead, we have volume is mass over density. Notice there's no need to solve this again, because I already did it once. I'm going to put 600 grams and 11.35 grams per centimeter cubed. And we can see that's really close to 10. So the answer here should be 60 centimeters cubed or maybe 50 centimeters cubed. So we're asked, which is the larger volume? Can we tell just by estimating our answers? Larger volume. And we could actually say that water has a larger volume because lead is more dense. Not because it weighs more, because it's more dense. Uh, it's always kind of interesting once you're a chemist and you hear people say, oh, the reason the rocks uh, uh, sink some water is because it's heavier. Not at all it sinks because it's more dense. I mean, if it were true that something's heavier that it's gonna sink, then uh, geez, um, we could come up with all sorts of conundrums, right? That would mean that a pound of feathers would uh, sink in half a pound of sand because it's heavier and that's not the case. Okay, so why, does the, why do the feathers not sink in the sand? They're less dense. Okay, so uh, that brings us to 2.30. Uh, we'll try to remember on Wednesday to pick up with number 18. You should take a look at the uh, density lab. There's a lot of stuff for you to do. We can, uh, I will also talk to you tomorrow about the density lab, uh, show you some things. Uh, but I think it's uh, written pretty well so that you should know what to do. You'll need 50 pennies minted after 83 and 50 dimes minted after say 64 because uh, dimes minted before 64 or I think in 64, 63 and so forth are made out of silver. We don't want silver dimes. Actually, I want silver dimes. They're worth more than a dime. So remember that whenever you find these really old nickels and quarters and dimes, save them because they're worth more than nickels, quarters, and dimes. All right. That being said, uh, turn your mics on and say goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow.